He changed the constitution to prolong his stay in power. He closed down some churches and mosques in Rwanda. Yet his developmental projects and forward-looking policies are undeniable. Are the rebel leader's good deeds a justification to his seemingly hard and dictatorial style of government? Is the suppression of some fundamental rights a good price to pay for economic growth and development? Let's dive into the life and actions of one of the most loved African presidents in the West, building the Singapore Africa through ruthless change. Paul Kagame was born in October 23, 1957 to a Tutsi ethnic group in Rwanda, which was the main tribe that was affected by the Rwandan genocide. Kagame's parents have royal ties. He was born around the period when the Tutsi ethnic group were in political power. But a short while after his birth, they lost the power to the Hutus. Pokagami and his family fled to Uganda to seek refuge after political unrest made it unsafe for the Tutsi who were residents in Rwanda. Most of Kagami's childhood years were spent in exile where his main political ideologies and general worldview were greatly shaped. Paul Kagame began his formal education near the refugee camp he grew up in and then moved to the Ringoro Primary School some years later. Paul Kagame graduated with distinction and then enrolled in one of Uganda's top schools, Ntare School. In the 1970s, Kagame lost his dad. This strategy greatly affected his academics and resulted in his suspension from school. Kagame came into the limelight during the Ugandan Bush War in 1981. He was part of a rebel group against the Ugandan government. Kagame's rebel army succeeded in their pursuit of overthrowing the Ugandan government in 1981, which led to him becoming the head of military intelligence. In turn, young Paul started making plans to invade Rwanda, an action that will ignite years of political conflicts, leading to one of the most tragic genocides ever recorded in history, and the eventual ascension of Mr. Paul Kagame to the office of the president of Rwanda. His presidency was birthed from the deaths of many Rwandians. The history and story of Rwanda cannot be told without the massive genocide. In 1994, the Tutsi ethnic group was targeted by the Hutu ethnic group who murdered about 800,000 of the Tutsis. This massacre began after a plane was shot down in the capital city of Rwanda. The plane was carrying Hambiyirimana, the then Rwandan leader and the president of Burundi. Both of these prominent figures lost their lives as a result. To this day, the culprits have not been identified. While some groups blame Hutu extremists, others blame the Rwandan Patriotic Front which was a group mainly consisting of Tutsi. The RPF invaded Rwanda from Uganda in 1990 and this led to massive unrest in the country, especially when Hambiya Rimana accused Tutsi locals of being accomplices in the RPF invasion and then ordered the arrest of Tutsi locals. As if this was not enough, government officials gave orders for many of the Tutsi to be murdered. Rwanda was not a pleasant place to be during that period. Ham Yarimana, in a bid to bring political stability into the country, signed an agreement in Tanzania to ensure a more inclusive and peaceful government where the RPF and its extension, the Tutsis, could occupy political offices. This gesture angered Hutu extremists started the massacre by murdering 10 Belgian peacekeepers and the moderates. Hutu Prime Minister Agate Uwilijimana, then extremist Hutu power leaders stepped in to lead the government. Masculines of the Tutsi began in Kigali and then spread across the whole of Rwanda. Government officials who resisted the genocide were removed from office and many of them were killed to send a warning to other government officials who were resisting the massacre. 
Killers were rewarded with money, drugs, drinks, or food. Government sponsored radio stations encouraged Rwandan civilians to murder their Tutsi neighbors. Within three months, over 800,000 people had been murdered. But this was just the beginning. The RPF also fought back and started a civil war across the whole country. Many Rwandans fled to neighboring countries like the Republic of Congo and Uganda to seek refuge. Refugee camps in these areas were packed. Rwanda's unpleasant past is a testament to why many Rwandans hail Kagame today. He keeps making strides to improve the development of the country and as we have taken a peep at the past, let's look into the present of Rwanda. Rwanda, just like other African countries, has gone through periods of political instability, civil wars and political unrest. When a new president emerges after destruction, a lot of weight is placed on his shoulders. Citizens expect him to rebuild and reconstruct the country out of the ruins. Pokagami became president of Rwanda in April 2000. And for the past 23 years, Rwanda has undergone major reforms and policy adjustments to ensure a steady development in the country. Every sector of the Rwandan economy has experienced some transformation. He has built more schools to reduce the distance some children have to cover in order to access formal education. Kagami has also stated in essence that access to education for children is very good and important. But in order to compete in the international labor market and be relevant in the world at large, children need high quality skills. In order for a society to be built, the children have to be educated and equipped. And Porkagami greatly subscribes to this notion, which is why he is serious about education. When it comes to healthcare, maternal mortality, which was previously a major problem for Rwanda, has seen a lot of improvement. Maternal mortality ratios have decreased by 77% from 2000 to 2013. Prenatal and antenatal care have also improved drastically, and newborn babies receive vaccines. This has gone a long way to eliminate the fear of death, especially amongst pregnant women in Rwanda. Still in relation to healthcare, Rwanda has undergone a massive transformation in infrastructural development. This is evident in the hospitals built by Mr. Kagame over the course of the years. He constructed the first 152-bed capacity hospital in the Burira district of Rwanda. The hospital was constructed constructed at a cost of $5.5 million and it features very relevant medical equipment to meet the health needs of Rwandans, especially those in that district. The president has stated that the hospital, apart from improving the health services of citizens, will also boost the socio-economic development of Rwanda. This is one of the examples of the major health-related facilities Porkagami has constructed. One of the most laudable projects of Kagami is the Rwandan Affordable Housing Project. The aim of the project is to build affordable housing units for poor Rwandans who cannot afford to build a house. The president cooperated with private entities to make the project possible. As I speak, 10 housing projects are being constructed in Kigali and it will have over 150,000 housing units when it is completed. The housing units will not stand alone. The areas will be transformed into estates that have shopping malls, recreational facilities, fiber optic cables for the internet, water, and electricity. In 2019, Porkagami completed the famous Kigali Arena, which is a multi-purpose event center. The Kigali Arena is the biggest indoor arena in East and Central Africa, and it has a 10,000 seating capacity. The multi-purpose arena hosts sports tournaments like basketball, volleyball, tennis, handball, and others. It is also used for musical concerts. On the back of these massive developmental projects is the economy of Rwanda, which is growing steadily across the span of two decades. Mr. Kagami is still on the mission of constructing Rwanda. 
These are just a few of the numerous examples. Many Rwandans are generally happy about the political stability and peace the country has enjoyed for decades under Kagame. But there are sections of the population who are of the view that Paul Kagame is a dictator who is intolerant of dissecting views. Now let's flip the coin and assess his dictatorial style. Human rights groups in Rwanda and across the world have accused Paul Kagame of suppressing freedom of expression in the country. This came to light when thousands of churches and over a hundred mosques across the country were closed down indefinitely. The reason for this was the alleged failure of the religious bodies to comply with noise, health and safety regulations set by the Rwandan government. Kigali was not left out of this massive close down. Over 714 religious buildings were closed down in the capital. Some Rwandan have perceived this act as an abuse of power and Kagami's attempt to limit their right to association and expression. The president has also been accused of trying to control the religious community. Kagami implemented new regulations which required pastors and church leaders to have degrees in theology before leading churches in Rwanda. According to the president, the reason behind this policy is to limit the activities of fake religious leaders in the country. Some Rwandans, however, believe their rights are being oppressed. Another fraction of Rwandans are of the view that Kagame's referendum to amend the constitution was an act to further solidify his dictatorial prowess and to lengthen his control over Rwandans. A referendum was held to amend Article 101 of the Constitution which stated in essence that every president is given a maximum of two terms. In December 2015, 98% of Rwandans agreed for an amendment to be made on Article 101 to give President Kagame another seven-year term in office. From the figures, a vast majority of citizens were in favor of the amendment, but some Rwandans have stated that the referendum referendum was not transparent. Whether you are a Paul Kagame supporter or not, we can agree that he is a charismatic leader who has garnered the respect of many leaders in Africa and across the world. He is a visionary who believes that Rwanda has many possibilities for the future. What does the future hold for the African country? Paul Kagame continues to make strides in Rwanda. The president's interest in digitization, modernization and technology brings a lot of hope and future possibilities for Rwanda and Africa as a whole. Rwanda's political stability, which has spanned for over two decades, has made the country a fertile soil for foreign investors who are visionary enough to see the future of Rwanda. In a speech at the 77th United Nations General Assembly meeting in September 2022, Paul Kagame expressed his desire to digitize many jobs and systems in Rwanda. The president believes that digitization is the future and it is needed to bring transformation to the country. Please subscribe to the channel for more relevant updates. Don't forget to turn on the notification bell so that you don't miss out on any of the videos I upload. Until next time.